go. All right. So um, please join me in welcoming to Peter White Public Library, my good, good friend, writer B.G. Bradley. Well, thank you so much, Marty. Um, and just a, a kind of a, an epilogue to the story you told about Alan Schust. I do remember what he said um, when I got done with that presentation. <laughs> In fact, I will never forget it. He looked at me and, he, and I had just gotten done singing and he looked at me and he said, don't quit your day job. <laughs> and then th thankfully, I mean, it was that was typical of Alan Schuess just to, to just stick a needle in you, but then he, he did say, say some kind things, but that was typical, typical of him too. And Marty, I just, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you so very much. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read uh, the foreword um, and then I'm gonna jump around a bit um, from tail to tail. Um, the foreword will kind of explain what I'm trying to get after here. And then uh, I believe we're gonna take some questions um, at the end. A gathering of old friends. Nobody anticipates a pandemic. So four years ago when Matt Dreyer, my publishing partner, suggested that there should be a Hunter Lake book about maple sugar season, I jumped on it. I wasn't thinking that a book about a gathering might be just what we need as an antidote for such a restrictive time because that time was still a couple of years away and nobody I know saw it coming. Almost right away, what I did think of was Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales and how good times at the sugar bushes of the UP are very much like such ancient spring pilgrimages. The slow times talking around the simmering tree sap boil are a precious piece of spring anticipated all year and remembered for years by everyone who takes part. The stories, the actions, the slow rise of wood smoke and sap steam run through the blood of families and every other sentence of whatever stories get told in that magic sweet atmosphere begins with, now grandpa used to Yes, sugar shack time is a tradition of gathering. Time slows, people sit back in discarded pinch bottom chairs inside makeshift sheds and elaborate ramshackle sugar houses and tell slow stories about old times. Syrup season is a time of togetherness. And yes, that is something we have very recently found in short supply between friends. Though strangely, and perhaps too great a supply among immediate family members, confined together at home. Actual physical separation from all our old pals is the norm in the moment I write this. And in response to that enforced distance from our friends, something primal in us aches. But things won't always be this way. Perhaps they have even changed by the time you read this. I surely hope so. And so now, maybe this collection of UP Outdoor Tales will serve as a celebration of what was once and will be or already is again. Enjoy your time at Ray Sugar Shack. Cherish this gathering of old friends. Now, the book is set up very much like, um, like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. It has a prologue, which is divided up before each little tale. Um, in, in poetry, there's a description of the characters and then uh, then each character tells a tale in prose. So I'm just gonna jump around with some of these, um, beginning with the introduction to the place itself, to Camp Grossi. The April Fool's Day Storm. The spring gave birth to April snow and drifts. Inside around the fire, they spoke in shifts. A rattled crew of foolish travelers spoke of life among the pines and woodland folk. The tales they told were funny, even sad, of mostly true adventures they'd all had. All our lit lives are made of what they said. We live the stories that you'll soon have read. The wood smoke stung all eyes among these friends, and swirling winds outside shifted north again, and always scent of maple sap arose from off the rolling boil upon the stove. It flavored all the tales with this year's taste. The host, the teacher set the evening's pace. Let's tell some stories while we wait the storm. 
I know we all know some, they'll keep us warm. And when the wind dies down and new snow stops, we'll toast the finest tail with finest hops. All there agreed and combed their hearts to find the greatest tale they knew to share in kind. And laughs ensued and tears a time or two. And in these pages, I'll share them all with you. Camp Grossi. The river was known locally as the Gross Roach or the Grossi. Ben O'Brien, a retired local English professor and semi-famous poet had always thought it would be easier just to call the water the Big Rock or the rock, since the voyageur who had named it uh, Le Gros Rocher was no doubt referring to the enormous glacial boulder along a bend a mile north of Ray Antilles camp. But as Ben well knew, fighting local custom, especially when it came to language, was a losing battle. Ray Antilles was a math professor at Hunter Woods College. The sugar shack was a fixture by the time of the great spring storm in a hangout for professors, high school teachers, a couple of local businessmen and women, some folks from the village and county crews and nearly anybody else who showed up at the door. And that was an odd mix on the night of the storm. The place was a monstrosity. Ray, who had a sense of humor not unlike his friend Ben, liked it that way. It had started as just a sugar shack in the Antilla family's maple stand above the grossy. Ray liked the idea of building the shack on those fine 40 acres and loved the idea of making the syrup having no idea at all of how to go about doing either. He'd slugged ahead anyway with local handyman Dale Sylvanus and the pups, Dale's little tribe, helping him out. And Ben land, lending a hand along with Ben's brother-in-law, Mark Hicks. Mark was useful that way. He actually knew what he was doing with saws and hammers. He even used power tools. Ben frankly knew even less than Ray about building and way less about syrup making. The shack had started as just one room for the stove under a little peaked roof with a couple cast off chairs and a ratty old couch inside. There was a lean to at first on the uphill side and a door which was a cast off from the local high school where Ben had been teaching at the time bolted into an uninsulated wood frame structure. The first addition after that were the bunk beds built by Mark on the wall furthest from the stove, a measure taken to avoid the steam rising from the sap. Dale had rigged up an ingenious spring-loaded trap door in the roof to allow the sweet steam to escape. Cute little structure to start. Then Ray got an idea. It would be a great place to deer hunt too. And the grossie was terrific duck hunting this close to Lake Superior, especially on rough days on the big lake. Why not build another room? So they did. A full-on bunkhouse on the uphill side, complete with peekaboo pictures, which slid aside so the guys could shoot at passing deer from their beds, and a duck blind, which, though not connected, was built just 40 steps downhill. What, though, was a hunting camp without a dining room? So that addition, too, was made. Soon, Camp Grossi was loaded down with eager sappers and pseudo-sappers, hunters and pseudo-hunters, and more room was needed. Rooms kept appearing, some with windows and walls facing into interior rooms, multiple doors leading to ridiculous destinations, ladders, lofts, porches, and verandas. By the time of the great spring storm at Camp Grossi, the place had three floors, multiple wings, and a platform high up among the maple branches with no safety railings of any kind known as fear and trembling post. The deal was all the deal was all newcomers had to go up and stand there on the narrow platform high in the treetops in the sometimes brisk wind coming off the grossy and chug a beer. If they did so, they got to write their names in a message on the underside of the platform while standing on the not so secure ladder beneath it. More than one camp grossy initiate had awakened the morning after his initiation, clinging to his bunk in a nightmare of cold sweat at the memory of the ceremony of the night before. Ray, who was a quiet, gentle sort with a dry sense of humor and a penchant for speaking only to deliver a one-liner at exactly the right moment, had a way of tapping his head, tipping his head back, taking a little gasp of air, then letting out a chuckle of pure enjoyment, which was most people's favorite thing about him. On one April Fool's night at Camp Grossi, all along the Gros Rocher, and as far as Hunter Lake and environs, both east and west, 
the snow came heavy and wet. Ray had a good boil going, and together with his sister Bev, Ben O'Brien, Mark Hicks, and local veterinarian Jeff Jessen, they had been tending the boil for two days in shifts. When the snow started to come, they shuttered down Camp Grossi to the best degree possible, but snow kept coming in through the cracks. And at the door, suddenly there were travelers, both lost and wandering, who for some reason found their way to this Rube Goldberg sugar shack on this of all nights. Some were in fact lost, but others just thought there could be no better place to be on April Fool's night when the powers that be were having a little fun with the local inhabitants in the form of this storm well after the first day of what laughingly passes for spring in the UP. Okay, now I'm gonna jump ahead to one of the tales. Um, and this is the third part of the prologue. And this is the teacher's tale. To tell her tale, a, a sturdy woman rose. Her name was Bev, the sister of our host. She worked with children three and 30 years. Tough as nails she was. And, and crafted beer. From working hard, her hands were, were not refined. The same could not be said of her quick mind. Her job with kids was teaching them to sew and cook and clean and make a home, although her lessons often rose above home ec, including poems and math, even high tech. The lady was a brass tax widowed mom. She'd lost her husband to the war in them. A daughter, too, succumbed, but on Bev went, lived her life well, although her heart was rent. Her way was cheerful, but she'd stop a room with one cold look, and then her smiles resume. And this is Bev's tale, the teacher's tale. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Buck at Billy Kin's Hardware. Billy Kin had a, a special on birdseed that day. He called me at home to let me know because he knew about all the birds I fed at the house. Billy Ken and me go way back. He knew my husband, Kenny, before the war and tried to be friends with him after. That was hard, impossible really for anybody who hadn't been there. Billy Ken and that whole Kinnanen family tried though. God love him. But that's not what this is about, eh? Anyway, let's get on with this story. While I was in there, I picked up some mouse traps and two cans of WD-40 to spray down my 12 gauge pump. Works, works as well as any gun oil, if you ask me. I've often thought since then that if I hadn't stopped for the WD-40 and mouse traps, I never would have seen it happen. Never would, have, never would have been there. What a thing that was. Wow. Anyway, I was the only one in the store except for Billykin, who was behind the counter. And you know, Billykin's store, uh, the Hunter Hardware, jammed to the rafters. Kids knock stuff off the shelves all the time without even trying. And ordinary men and women and old ladies like me, all you had to do was turn around to cause a disaster. But none of that came close to what happened that day. So I was right in the middle of the store, the center of the, the five aisles of the long, narrow space when it happened. I had just grabbed the WD-40. When I looked to the north, out that big front window, and I saw him, a 12-point buck. I don't know what possessed him. Of course, they're around all the time, what with the folks that feed them on the outskirts of Hunter and even right in town. I don't know how many people, all the newcomers for sure, I've told not to do that. It causes a mess with snowmobiles and cars and brings the wolves right into town sometimes at night, and definitely the coyotes. And then people get all upset. It's silly, it's just silly. Anyway, there he was staring right at me through the window. It only occurred to me later that what he was really staring at was the buck he saw there, his reflection. He was obviously in the rut and ready for a fight. I was just about to turn to Billiken and tell him what I was seeing when I heard Billiken say, holy shit, Bev, there's a boom. He jumped and blasted right through the damn front window and landed right in the center aisle, not 10 feet away from me. Then he just stood there. He was kind of dazed, I think. I don't know if he was looking for a handout or what, but he sure got more than he bargained for. Somehow he hadn't cut himself at all, although there was glass everywhere. And obviously we, he blasted right through it to get where he was. He kind of shook his head, pawed the floor and started walking towards me, knocking everything off the shelves as he came. 
I turned and ran for the back of the store, but he kept coming and stuff was flying everywhere. The rack of mousetraps, cans of WD-40, fly swatters, brooms, dustpans, mops. And now he moved further down the aisle and started sorting out the cans of air freshener and, and two cycle motor oil. I ran around the shelf and Billy can called out to me, Bev, come get behind the counter with me. That was a fine idea, I thought, but the buck was chasing me for some reason. At the time, I was thinking he blamed me for the trouble he was in for some reason, but of course, he was just looking for that other buck. Anyway, the buck tried to come around the count to the corner and knocked into the center aisle shelf, knocking it completely over into the next shelf, and they, they were like dominoes, one after the other. And the noise, if the buck wasn't rattled already, that surely shook him up. By the time I was coming down the aisle in front of Billykin's counter and he grabbed me from behind and behind it and pulled me over just at the last shelf came down and fell right on top of the counter, spilling all the contents onto us where we lay in a heap together. We could still hear him bashing around the store, snorting and pawing. He was really mad. Billykin peeked around the corner and said, look out. He was coming right at us with his head lowered and he slammed his antlers right into the north end of the counter. Then he reared back and tried again before snorting and giving us one, of a, one last baleful look. Then he turned towards the open space that used to be Hunter's hardware front window and bounded back out into the street. Well, Billykin and I looked at each other and hugged and just laughed and laughed. In the end, it was a good day, though. Billy had a mess to clean up. I helped him with that mess. And like I say, that old bachelor and I kind of connected over that crazy thing. And we've been seeing each other ever since. Though we'll never marry. I don't think we're both, I think we're both uh, so set in our ways. It was that crazy buck in the rut and ready to battle that brought us together. As for the buck himself, well, several folks in town saw him later that day and said he didn't have a scratch on him, but he did carry around four or five price tags and a car, a car air freshener or two on his antlers for a while because several folks saw him as late as a week or so later in the woods. And once, seven or eight years later, I'm positive I saw him when I was cranberry picking out on the moor behind Hunter Lake. He looked good. He had his nose to the ground, still trailing the ladies. Boys never learn, that, boys never learn their lesson that way, it seems to me. I often wonder if he remembers the day he visited Billiken's hardware. So now we get a, a, a story from Billiken. Uh, this is the merchant's, uh, merchant's story. Um, there was a merchant, Billiken by name. He was good natured, up for any game. His name, a crazy mashup pseudonym, William plus the, the family Kinnanen. He ran a hardware store in Hunter's Heart, an odd collection, quite a work of art. Um, quite a work of art of items that won't perish on the shelf, a good reflection of the man himself. A smile was always Billy's friendly way. He greeted all with, what a lovely day. If you entered Billy's place depressed, he'd kid you till you left, restore your zest. Couldn't find your item there in store? They really do not make those anymore. A quip always in customary place. He always had a smile upon his face. Billykin's tales. No end to practical jokes. Well, now, the way Bev tells it, you'd think we were seeing each other or something. That deer did get us close, though. No way around it. It's an event dear to my heart. Huh. Get it? Oh, I'm sure you do. Ow! Not so hard, Bev. Anyway, for all the silly jokes I play on folks that come into the mercantile, I guess I've gotten a few played on me, too. It about evens out. Now, some folks say I've got too many things in that store. They wonder, for instance, how I'm ever going to sell a horse collar in this day and age. Well, you never know. You never know. And if some old farmer suddenly walked in, I'd be glad I had it. And so would he. Well, anyway, one day, quite a couple of springs ago, Ben and Ray stopped in during the sap run looking for some wire, some tin snips, some work gloves. Do you think those two Jaspers could find any of those things? I teased them both about being absent-minded professors, and they both said it would take more than a PhD to find anything in my store. Well, I told them I knew where everything was and could lay my hands on anything they asked for in a matter of moments. 
And then I walked right to the wire, tin snips and work gloves. Anything else, gentlemen? Well, the two of them gave each other a quick look and I should have picked up on the fact that this wasn't gonna be the end of it. So anyway, for the next six months or so, a funny thing started happening. All of a sudden, new things started appearing in the store that I never remembered buying from the wholesalers. Odd little things, a shiny new trigger for a 12 gauge, a cheap porcelain bust of George Washington, a couple of vintage Fantastic Four comic books, a Pez dispenser with Billy Carter's head on it, a metal kazoo with Kokomo, Indiana stenciled on it. Then the best one of all, one of them sets of leather brassiere and panties complete with a whip. Now, every one of these items had a tag on it with a price written in Bev's handwriting. She does the tags for me because nobody else, nobody else could read my chicken scratching. And all the prices seemed about right, though I wasn't sure about the leather stuff. And I kind of tucked it under a counter so the church folks wouldn't get upset. So I figured I must be slipping. Then one day, Ray and Ben walk in with list for, this shack, for the shack just as sugar season was warming up. And that usually means a good payday for me. Well, they started with the usual kind of items for the sugar season, some mouse and rat traps for the shrews and squirrels and chipmunks to get, to get at the tubing. Some more tubing, of course, some tin buckets. And then they start listing off all the items I just mentioned. Well, I didn't bat an eye for a while, but when they got to the bra and stuff, I, I kind of looked, looked at them. Ray looks at me and he says, well, that's for when you come out, Billykin. Yeah, Ben says, we want a floor show. And then Ben comes out from, and then Bev comes out from behind the counter and all, all three of them have a big laugh on me. Of course, Ben wrote up the labels and stuck the items in the, Bev wrote up the labels and stuck the items in the store. He was a good one, I got to say, but I got him back later that year. And a couple of folks are here tonight that were in on it too. The fall after they pulled that gag, on me the day of Halloween, Janie and Marie there, they'd just come back from, from uh, back here from out west, then came into the mercantile looking for some plastic flowers for their Halloween outfits. Well, you know those two, they were just giggling and having a great time. They were going out with Ike and Danya there and they said uh, to some crazy party and they were both dressed as pregnant brides. So I take them aside and I say, I happen to know that Dr. O'Brien and Dr. Anla are out at Camp Grossi tonight. They're planning for a big duck hunt in the morning on the river. Why don't you two stop out there tonight and pretend like you're looking for them dressed like that with a particular purpose in mind, you know? I'll stop out, out on them just like I'm, I'm visiting. Could you show up, say, 7.30 or so? Well, those two, they, they just started laughing away and said, sure. So about 7.30 that night, there comes a knock on the door over there and a trick, trick or treat. And those two goofs, Ben and Ray, are sitting there in their long johns. Ray looks at Ben and says, who could that be? The door opens and the two pregnant brides come in and they didn't even smile. I had to turn around in my chair for a second to keep from, keep from breaking. Janie says, well, you had your treats months ago and now here's a little trick for the two of you. When, you, when, you're, when are you gonna do right by us? Well, it, Took Ben a second or two to recognize Marie, his friend Jeff's daughter, but Ray was still in the dark when they, huff, when they huffed on out. You'll be hearing from our lawyer, Janie says over her shoulder. Ray looks at me and Ben says, and Ben says, what the hell was that? And then I just couldn't stand it anymore. Teach you to add items to my shelves, I said. Then Ray cocked back his head the way he does, like he's doing right now. Let out a laugh, just like that one. Nah, that was a good night. Good night. Okay, and now I'm going to jump um, to the to the very end, uh, the very end of the book, um, and and the entrance of a, a very important character. And all of these characters are going to be going to be uh, uh, major figures in in two books that are going to be coming out soon. One at Christmas. Um, which is entitled Old Hunter, and then uh, another next fall, which is, uh, which is entitled Seasons and Hunter. And each of those is going to have four uh, Hunter novellas in it, um, four longer stories like the, like the first uh, three books. Anyway, 
um, we get to the to the last of the last of the tales here, um, and this is the old Walker's tale. A man who'd walked these woods for an age past came late in from the snow. He was the last of all the folks who came inside that night. He came in silently and found their light and the warmth of maple fire, friendly talk. They all had seen him on his famous walks. But on this night, this ancient elder said, speaking from the doorway of the shed, I'm here to tell a story, share your time. Our host said in surprise, well, that'll be just fine. And so the man began to tell his tale and one led to another without fail. And none there said a word the while he talked. And when he finished up away, he walked back out into the storm from whence he came. And all knew Charlie One Duck was his name. Charlie One Duck's tale, The Three-Day Chase. Now, most of you think I'm a stranger, though Dr. Ray's story there tells you a little about me, maybe a little more than is comfortable to know, but that's good. No man should be thought of just one way because no man is just one way. But many of you still think of me as a stranger, even after that story. And maybe you're a little afraid of me, but please have no fear. I'm glad Ray told the story. I appreciate that he did and I mean that much to him. But still, you will think of me as strange or as a stranger. I know that. But still, uh, I I'm the old Indian, uh, the sea out walking. <laughs> you probably think I'm a ghost. Well, not yet. None of you are strangers to me, though. I've seen you all many times, mostly when you didn't see me. Like young Dr. O'Brien there. Oh, I've seen him lots of times around the lake. I've even stop by at his camp a time or two when he was younger, a boy, really. I'd seen him in some pretty good predicaments too over the years when he didn't know. I didn't step in though, because he had his dogs with him. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like, like that so funny, Doc? You know as well as I do that if you've got your dogs with you, you're never lost and you'll always be all right. Truth be told, I bailed your daddy Jim out of a mess or two in, in his time. And Ray's, Dr. Ray's father, too. And I've been watching this place of yours for years, Ray Andla. What have you got built here? Looks more like a beaver lodge than a man's house. But it suits you all. I'll say that. It suits you all. No offense intended. Now, this story starts with the first wife. She was a stout girl and hunted pretty well on her own. But during this fall, we're talking about she bashed your foot good when the when the wood stove oven door came loose one day, she had a goose in the oven and the door and the goose fell right on her foot. The goose was still good though. Anyway, with her bad foot, she decided to set herself up in a blind with a longbow. She kept her bad foot propped up on a limb while I did my usual stalking. We would both had bucks picked out for a good while. We both knew right where they'd go when the blaze orange army came into the woods. We were waiting there deep in the, in the Gros Rocher swamp. Well, my buck took a turn I didn't expect and wandered right into some downstate hunters blind. I believe the fellow's name was Richter, Jan Richter, auto worker from Detroit. I knew his father too, both kind of wild types. And I'll tell you something about them if you, you don't mind another story before I get to the main one. One time those fools came up here with a whole lot of their friends, all of those, all of those car factory boys from Detroit. And the night before the opening of the rifle season, they built a big fire outside their old army surplus tent that they always pitch in the clearing down the way. Still do, though it's got some patches in it these days. White men always build way bigger fires than anybody needs, like it's some kind of festival or something. And I guess it is. So they build this big fire. And old Richter, he was a big fat fella. So his plan suited in that way anyway. But he goes into the tent and gets out an old bear rug he brought along just to do this joke. And he throws it over himself and then goes stumbling out to the fire, pretty drunk by then, they all were. And he acts like a bear growling and pawing around in a way and that didn't look anything like a bear. But anyway, it fooled those fools. And one of their friends, a fellow named Bruce Kendall, I believe, had a Colt pistol strapped to his hip and he draws it out like an old gunslinger from TV and shoots what he thinks is a bear right in the knee. Well, to say that ruined old Richter's hunting season is an understatement. 
he and his son spent it in the hospital. Oh, I forget the, I forgot to tell you that when Kendall shot his old man, it, it shot his old man, young Richter went after him. And this time the gun went off accidental and that bullet caught young Kendall a glancing blow on the right wrist. When they got out of the hospital, old Judge Breyers got the Richters and Kendall into his court, called them all damn fools, fined them $100 fool tax, and told them they could keep coming up here so long as they shot e all they shot was each other and the deer. And then he sent, sent, sent them on their way. Anyway, getting back to the first story, young Richter couldn't have missed my buck with his fancy Winchester rifle. Well, it, would have been hard to anyway, because I practically chased him right into, into the blind. So that wasn't what I'd planned by a long shot. Beware of plans, beware of plans. And so you're probably trying to figure out why he's hunting with a rifle, and my first wife and I with bows. <laughs> you would wonder that. Fair enough, I'll just say this and answer. A season isn't on the calendar or any other piece of paper. It's in the wind. Just know I've always been out there when I need to be, and most of you, including the CEOs, don't know I'm there anyway. I hope that isn't a hurtful thing to say. No harm intended either way. Anyway, about the time I see my buck get taken by Richter, who, like I just said, doesn't even know I'm there, I hear the first wife's high-pitched whistle signal, which can cover a mile or two, so I, I head out for her blind. She tells me her buck came right in just as planned, but... When she pulled back and notched the arrow on her bow, her foot shifted just a bit and she banged it again and the shot went off and the arrow, one of our hand, hand carved ones, nicked the, nicked the buck hard on the right front leg instead of heading right for the heart in a clean kill. She was pretty upset for two reasons. One, it was a very fine buck, one she'd been watching grow for years. And two, she didn't ever want to do a deer or anything else harm for no good reason any more than I would. Go find that buck, Charlie, she said. I just nodded and smiled at her. That'll do, I said. And after she gave me all the, and after she gave me all the jerky and cold cooked wild rice she had in her pack and a good deer hide bag full of water to match the one I already had, I headed out. You gonna be all right getting back home with that foot, I asked. What do you think, she said. And she limped away, swinging her bow over her shoulder. Go find my buck, she said, without ever looking back. Well, normally when you hit one and don't drop him true, as you probably know, you wait a while for him to walk and bleed out and then fall down. But this one was hitting the leg and from what I could see, not very bad at all because he was still on foot on, on, on four legs and the blood trail was pretty thin. And being scared now and, and hurt, he was gonna probably go as fast as he could to the deepest part of the swamp up the other side of Porcupine Rise. And if he got over the rise, all 800 feet of it, or feet or so of it, and got into that swamp down the Le, Pe Le Petit Rocher, uh, this stream that feeds the Gros Rocher, and then kept going on toward the dark woods above the small lake, well, nobody goes in there. And I was gonna lose him for sure. And the wife was pretty mad about it at all to begin with, or hurt foot, I mean. She'd been cooking that goose for, for me. She, she never cared for goose and I'd insisted on it. So see, even if, I didn't, even if I didn't love her, which I did a good bit, truth be told, fine old girl, I was still obligated. Besides, if that buck's wound didn't, heal, didn't seal up good, it might get good and infected and he'd die slow and painful out there in that swamp all alone. Oh, I didn't like that thought, even if I wasn't facing the wife's ire. So off I go after the old, old fellow buck and he was moving along, let me tell you. There was a couple of inches of snow, so there was good tracking and the blood was still coming, staying thin, but a spot or two all along if you're, you've got good eyes. And so I kept after him. Porcupine Rise is a beast. And I hoped against hope that maybe it would wear him out with his bad leg. But after the two hour, four mile climb to the top, he was still moving very fast, but the blood trail was, getting a, a touch thicker. Still, even from the top of the rise through the leafless hardwoods below, I could not see him. I knew then that my brother, this great buck, would not let me catch him easily. I took a good long drink from the buckskin bag as I headed down. I picked, I picked my way because 
as some of you may know, going downhill is much more dangerous than going up. The temptation, especially in pursuit, is to run, and that's when a man gets hurt. By the time I got back down and into the thick of the pines and hemlock, he was long gone and had an even bigger lead. He knew I was coming. I worked along the Rochier Petit and found a puzzle. His trail had disappeared. I walked on ahead a half mile through that thick pine woods and saw no sign, not so much as a broken twig. I worked back to the last clear signs and had an idea, but I couldn't believe it was true. Still, I humored myself and worked back downstream to the north and there, as I had suspected but could not believe, I found proof. The old one had felt me coming, stepped into that freezing creek and walked it downstream half a mile, then came out, walked east half a mile through the softwoods, up a parallel track upstream from the lake of glimmering glass, the one you call Hunter Lake. How could a deer know to double back? How could a deer know to use the water to throw off his scent? This was an old spirit I was pursuing. Now I was well behind him, but the blood trail was getting thicker and he would surely reach the dark woods before I could head him off. Let me catch you, brother. I think of your welfare. That's what I said to him with the north wind blowing in his direction. What I would do if he got into the dark woods, I did not know. I did not know if I had the courage to pursue him there, but that was where he was bound. Back on the trail along the Petit, he tried his tactic again, dropping into the creek, but this time heading south upstream. I quickly found his trail again a mile ahead, and now I was getting winded. The blood trail was getting thick indeed. By the time he dropped into the creek a third time, I, I worked upstream, but the trail was gone, just short of the dark woods. I sat on a stump and thought, brother, have you worked downstream again? He had even further than he had before. And then a fourth and fifth time he dropped into the stream, working finally six miles downstream, almost to the full waters of La Grosier. The blood trail headed east and then back upstream again. He didn't want to enter the dark woods any more than I did. It was well into afternoon by this time and dark was coming. It would be very cold. It was a time for some bold thinking. Should I leave this, his trail and work east to the logging road where the going would be much faster, then follow it south, then take a west line to try to cut him off just before the dark woods. I didn't like the idea of staying out here in the night. I didn't like the idea of going off his trail. All kinds of things might happen in the time between. That would send him in another direction. I didn't like the idea of simply going home and picking up the track in the morning either. It would take me hours to find it even if I took my truck down the logging road. What would happen in the night? And what would my young wife say? No, best to stay on this track. I decided guess, guesswork about his intention took too much risk. Steady and true on the trail. That was all I could do for now. I took a deep breath. I had grown weary. I had grown very tired and headed off again. And now the track became strange. It was joined by other tracks. In the clearing, I saw there where other deer had joined him. This would seem to be a comfort for him. He walked with them a time. And then I laughed reading the sign. He had mated with a doe here the old rascal, bleeding out all the time. Good for you, brother. And then still further on, another buck joined him, and battle ensued. The other buck's track was heavy, too. There were two mighty old warriors, and then something new. I'd heard of it before, but never seen it. The track moved on sideways, and blood was everywhere. The great antlers had intertwined and locked up in, in the battle. And now a strange track indeed. My brother was moving on toward the dark woods, dragging the carcass of the other buck he'd killed along with him. He had no choice. Their antlers were still caught. I was getting close. That's when I smelled them. Other brothers were around, ahead and behind me. The wolf pack was on the scent, and there were plenty of them. Not one fine deer, but two were the prize. I knew I would never beat them to him. The wife would be, would be angry, but would understand our brothers the wolves had beaten me to the bucks more power to them still i wanted to see what the kill that the kill was clean and that no one suffered unduly my brother wolves would not grudge me a look i drew close and saw the pack ahead a scout was to the west watching from the woods so i circled east and came within clear viewing distance there was only one deer under their jaws and straight ahead lay the end of the clearing in the dark woods the deer the, the deer the wolves devoured was the one my brother deer had battled and killed. My brother deer had gone into those dark woods. 
The wolves had driven him to desperate measures. I circled west to the east to the edge of the wood and found his trail thick with blood. He would die in there, likely tonight. At the least, he would sleep, and the blood trail of my dead brother would be too big a temptation for Brother Bear or Fisher or Coyote or even Fox. And once in those dark woods where it is said the dark wood Manitou live, it would be a danger for all our brothers. The wife and I had started this chase. It was our place to finish it. I plunged, plunged against all good judgment into the dark woods and quickly lost his trail among the potholes and sinkholes and deadfalls. There was water everywhere at the foot of the giant hemlocks. The blood trail was clear though, clear though and I was getting closer. Let me find you, my, let, you, let me find you by dark, brother. But I did not. He worked a winding trail still after all his toil, battle, and pleasure. He was more determined than I, and barely knowing where I was, with full dark now on me, and with no way of leaving the wood without falling in some trap of the Manitou and dying in a hole, I ate a good bit of the jerky, took three long pulls, finishing the first water sack, took out the Hudson Bay wool blanket my grandfather had won in a card game from a French trapper, and tried to sleep against the trunk of a high, dry hemlock. It was a battle, but sleep won. Dreams came. I saw my brother deep in this forest. He turned, panting hard, and looked at me. He said, sleep well, one duck. You will have a chase tomorrow when the sun comes. I am not afraid, and I know these woods. I've been here before. Have you? I know these woods as well as any of our kind can, but I'm near blinded now. You have that advantage. Will you follow? And then my dream deer laughed a good clean laugh. He meant me no harm of spirit. It was a friendly challenge, a brother's wager of a kind, a fair wager, my life against his. All right, brother, I'm coming. With the barest light, I took up the chase again. The old buck wound his way through that wood like a cougar cat. A brother bear was behind us and woofed a call to me once to ask what I thought I was doing, a man in the world of the dark wood Manitou. A brother's wager, old long claw. He calls me on the chase, I must go. The old bear woofed a laugh at me. Enjoy then, it will be hard going. It was, and the blood trail was thinning out. The hours of sleep had done him good, more good than my fitful sleep had done me. At last, I came to a place where I could find no track at all. I was far, far too from anything familiar. I knew directions still, and I thought I could walk out to the glimmer glass lake, but I would lose my brother's wager by not risking my life to find him. That was when the Manitou came. What do you hear, brother? The voice came from a giant hemlock with a gnarled trunk. A brother's wager, but you knew that already. Why bother asking, dark one? His laugh was not clean. He was full of malice. Yes, yes. Well, I can show you a good way to find him, a cheap way, just a quick walk ahead and you can head him off through a dark spirit pass and finish him. He circles around you, watching your moves to choose his. I had thought as much some moments earlier and it had filled me with doubt. Was my brother deer just toying with me? Was he a natural deer at all? Or was he the Manitou? Don't doubt yourself, just follow me and end this. I wasn't sure who was talking now, deer or tree, and which was the Manitou, or both. No, I had followed this brother deer in the clean woods and swamps to the north. He was true. This was the brother's wager. And if he was circling me, I would need to join this, his circle and keep the chase, not use some dark spirit to find him dishonestly with dark medicine. Besides, my father had told me that the dark Manitou, all dark spirits, use the dark that is in us, the doubt, the hate, to trick us into bad ways. They have no power beyond what we allow them. I should allow this one none. Go back inside your tree, old giant. You are no brother of mine. I took a pull from the second skin and started out first west, then east, then north, and finally south, hoping against hope that the deer was heading back to ground I knew, but he was not. I had wasted my time. I had known deep inside before I took my tangents that the true way lay south and deeper into the woods. So I headed south, following no sign, but only a direction. I walked an hour, perhaps two, and there was no sign still and the wood was growing darker. Ready for the spirit road yet, brother? That was the Manitou. Go back to your tree. Oh, now be reasonable. You may die here without me. That was the wager. 
I made with my brother. Go back to your tree with your tangled words. Oh, brave little one. All right, just call when you know you failed. I was sorely tempted. He had the easy answer, but my father and my grandfather had told me there would be a big price to pay if I took such a way. I summoned my courage. I will not fail, dark one, even if I die. I won't go your way. Quit wasting your time, my time and yours. Then I heard laughter in the woods and became the calling of a raven. That dark spirit was gone. I sat down. It made no sense to pursue. I sat and thought and remembered something, something my brother dear had said, but I am near blinded now. What did that mean? He had not walked like a blind creature, this dear. He had walked true on his path, true to his plan. How was he blind? And then I thought of his fight with the other buck and of the wolves devouring his enemy. I had never really seen the carcass of the other deer. My brother had given me a, a sporting hint and I had ignored it. I needed to find a place where I could use my sight, which I knew now for certain was a sense he lacked. I looked about me and to the west, there was a stand of bare branch maples. I walked that way and found a tall one climbing high and looking about. It was exhausting and I knew if I didn't see my brother now, I might well lose the wager and never come out alive. High in the tree, I looked to all directions but saw nothing. But then on a hard gust of north wind, a low hemlock branch snapped and fell and cleared a viewing space. There was my brother resting and hiding against the trunk of the tree. His antlers were still interlocked with those of the head of his adversary. The other buck's head hung right before his eyes, blocking his vision. Back there, before the dark woods, he had shaken and torn his brother's warrior's body from its head and left it for the wolves. He had not seen me climb the tree and did not know I saw him. I took my bow from my shoulder and notched an arrow. I lined up the shot. It would be a long one, but he was still and I could make it. As I lined along the arrow, aiming for my brother's heart, the wind swirled and the dark manitou called. It's a long shot, brother. Are you sure it's clear? Just one little twig, one little twig to throw you off. Shut it, dark one. This is between my brother and me. And that little burst of pride cost me my moment. My brother suddenly raised his head. He had scented me on the shifting wind of the Manitou and he bolted still with the other old warrior's head hanging from his antlers. I let the arrow go and it struck and stuck in the shoulder of the same wounded leg. I heard the laughter and the raven call again, but I spoke over the racket to my true brother. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. I did not mean to make you suffer or play you false. It is not your doing, brother. I know the work of the dark Manitou. He tempted me too. Come, come on if you can. And now cold, hungry, and tired, I dropped down to the ground and ran off in pursuit, gobbling the last of the jerky as I went. My brother was on three legs now and it could not possibly go on much longer, but it did. We worked our way out of the world, out of the, world of the Manitou, out into the true good forest north of the glimmer glass, then east across the bog along the big mud lake. The moor moss was springy and full of holes and no one could know it well, but we worked together chasing each other in and out of the freezing water and along the cattails and then down to the shore of the glimmer glass and bigger water and along the beach. My brother wasn't hiding himself now. He was just running on three good legs as fast as he could go. He headed north again and I feared he would head back into the world of the Manitou, but I'd passed that test already and he would not put me through it again. He ran up over, over the Birch Ridge, just to the north, just to the north down a logging road and out near the great road that heads west. Then he circled west, headed back for the lake where he plunged in and began to swim across. I arrived three minutes behind him and saw his head above the water 300 yards out. I could not make such a shot or play him false in that way if I did. It was a heroic, and true gamble he was taking. I could not cheapen it. Nearly played out, I ran and limped and crawled my way west past the camps where a few of you called out to me, including your father, Jim, Dr. O'Brien. Your father saw how played out I was and invited me in for breakfast, but I thanked him over my shoulder and told him breathless and not too rudely, I hope, that I was meeting a friend. By the time I reached the other side of the lake and found his track on a stony beach, he picked deliberately to keep me off his trail, he'd already headed up the next ridge, which was thick with fir trees, giving me no line for, no line for a shot. 
I knew the high country to the south of the lake lay ahead and beyond that nothing but woods all the way to Lake Michigan, 30 miles or more ahead on a straight line and he wasn't going straight. Still, I followed him at one point picking up the trail thick with blood again now from the new wound. The blood from his adversary's head was long bled out. How could he move this fast, this long wounded, this, this long wounded with an arrow still in him and blinded by the head on three legs? I am not worthy of you, brother. Of course you are, come on. Still I followed his trail and then the second night came and we both rested only a half mile apart, I guess. And in the night, a great storm came with the wind of the north and the snow buried me, yet still I slept under an old beach on some soft moss. My water bag was near empty, but not frozen as I kept it under my arm, but I had foolishly not stopped to refill at the lake. And we were in high dry timber country now and it was filling up with snow. I woke up in the night, remembered my mistake in not filling the water bag and cursed myself, shivering in the great storm as the great storm continued, but there was nothing for it. I took a small sip and went to sleep. In the dark, darkest night, the dark man at Sue's voice called out to me from high on the other ridge of his forest across the glimmer glass. Tomorrow, come back here and I'll show you an even bigger deer. The wife will not know. The one you chase is an evil spirit, a phantom. You'll never catch him. You'll die trying. No one will ever know what became of you. The wife and all your children will die in tears. He was good at his job, that dark man too. But I called back to him. Stew in your own juices, you wretched heart. Die if you can in your own pool of treachery or live forever tempting yourself to lower and lower places. I woke to the raven calling in my brother's voice. Come on. It ends today. I chased him that morning into the high country through all that driving snow and over a rocky bluff that I had only heard of in stories. And then he led me over rise after rise and I knew it was all but over for one of us. Each time I stumbled over a rise, I, could, I would be certain I would see him, but always his voice was on the wind, come on. He doubled back, headed through all that high country over the ground we had just covered and headed back for the lake diving in just as I came over the last ridge. I almost quit then. And then I saw something gnarled and coated with dried blood with 16 tines of horn extending from it lying there on the beach, the head of his great brother warrior. I looked out at the glimmer glass, which he had come back to once again, and he was there 70 yards out. Again, I had no shot. I went to the shore, filled my bag, drank my fill. His voice called to me on the, on the north wind as he swam. Drink deep, brother. I'll meet you on the other side. Around the lake and past the camps, I went again, truly trudging now, but running in short bursts when I could stand it through a foot and a half of snow. I was younger then and still had a reserve of power of youth and found a way to run on to the true clean ridge. I climbed from the north to where I was fairly certain he would come out of the lake at last. He had, he had tired and he was still in the water as I stood and lined up the shot. He walked out onto the beach and scented me, then looked up. He was enormous, the biggest buck I'd ever seen. The antlers were a mass of tines too numerous to count. His shoulders were broad, but they sagged and heaved. Finish it, brother. And I did, sending an arrow through his true heart and then collapsing myself high on the ridge. Your father found me there, Dr. O'Brien, and saw to it that I would live. Then he finished the work on my brother by the shore and took us both home to my wife who had tea on the stove. She nursed me for days. And when I came back from the darkness, she fed me the halves of the heart of my brother. How are you now? The wife asked after I had eaten the heart, stronger than ever, thanks to my brother. My wife smiled and I told her this whole story. Then we got back to our daily world and never spoke of my adventure again. We were saving for some special time, some special gathering, a retelling. She passed away long ago, never having heard it again. And I have saved it in my heart all these years. And when the storm came tonight, looking just as it did that long ago time of the hunter's moon, I knew this was the day for the retelling. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. I'm sorry, Marty. I know I ran a little over time. That's that's all right. I I, I don't think anybody minded that. Um, uh, we uh, I'll give a, a couple minutes here in case anybody has any comments or questions for BG. 
um, you're more than welcome to. What um, Gideon says, was it a non-typical buck? <laughs> I guess it must have been. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it was that that story is actually based on a, on a real story that was told to me when I was a newspaper reporter. Wow. Uh, you know that um, when I was listening to that story, I sort of had this feel, and I don't know if this is it was in your head or when you were writing it, but it sort of felt to me, uh, it kind of reminded me of the old man in the sea when I was when when I was reading it. Probably inevitable. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, Hemingway was, especially in my youth, was a huge influence on my writing, no question mm -hmm. about it. And The Old Man in the Sea is my favorite, favorite book of his by far. Yeah, 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 I, I thought it was, um, the, I mean, it just, it, it had that feel for me. And, and so I, I just, I, I was kind of curious whether that had some kind of influence. But, you know, I think anything that we read has that kind of influence, no matter what, we sort of absorb it. And, and when we're sure. reading it, it just yeah. comes out, yeah. so. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I know we, we ran a little bit over, but um, I, I, I really enjoyed that um, that last story. It was amazing. Um, anybody? Let's see, I'm gonna check the chat just to make sure. Okay. Oh, Gideon said it did remind him of, uh, of the old man in the sea. Gideon has read that story, so. Oh, good for you, Gideon. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one to start with, for sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh, he says it's one, Gideon says it's one of his favorites. So. Good, good. All right. Well, um, BG, um, I want to thank you and I want to thank um, everyone for coming. I want to thank my, uh, my, my, my bouncer here, Roberta, who takes care of all my technical stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, takes care of the muting and everything. And Every, and that, and just to let everybody know um, who's here, um, BG's book is available on Amazon.com. If you wanna, if you wanna go and it, order, it's that. also now at Snowbound as well. If you wanna, if you wanna drop over there. And it's Snowbound. Are the ones at Snowbound signed? They are. Okay, yeah. so if you want an autographed copy, um, uh, you can pick one up at Snowbound. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. I will also be there December fourth signing books. So. If you're, if you're oh, well, why don't you just wait till December 4th then and then go in and get <laughs> it? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, and your new book is coming out. When did you say your new book? Um, right around December the 1st. So there probably will be another new book. Um, Old Hunter um, will be out by then as well. Yeah. All right. So look for BG to be reading for the library in January from his new book then. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, 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 right. I, won't be, I won't be at camp at that point. I'll be home. Okay. Well, that's good. So, right. you know, all right. Well, um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and um, thank you, uh, BG, again for a really, really wonderful reading. Th thank you so much for having me, Marty. This was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See you later, everyone. And Keep an eye on our schedule. We got lots going on. Bye, Mr. Roberta. <laughs> His hand makes a cameo at the end. So <laughs> see you.